News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, Mother-in-Law Murder in Armagh, Ireland. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Armagh, Ireland in 1905. Isaac Pearson has been accused of rape as he sits in his cell contemplating his assured doom. He speaks of a dream that he has had of his wife and sister killing his mother. His mother had passed several months before. His wife had run off to Canada. Officials are sceptical, but in a due diligence kind of way, they exhume his mother's body and are astounded by the volume of metallic mercury and strychnine found in her system. Isaac's wife had emigrated to Canada and his sister had moved to England. This astonishing tale from 1905 gripped the country at the time. We investigate the crime and the story behind the murdering of the mother-in-law in Northern Ireland in today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. The family members. Alice Pearson, aged 74, is the matriarch of the family with savings of an equivalent value of £15,000 in 2024. Isaac Pearson, her son, Sarah Ann Pearson, her son's wife and her daughter-in-law, and Agnes Aggie Black, her married daughter. About Alice Pearson. Alice Pearson, in her retirement, had her son, daughter and their respective spouses move in with her. Unfortunately, family tensions arose, leading to conflicts between Alice and her children, Isaac and Agnes, and with her daughter-in-law, Sarah Ann. Despite having some savings, Alice's children swiftly depleted Alice's money. In a questionable move, her daughter Agnes took out life insurance on her mother for the substantial amount of eight pounds, fourteen shillings, worth a little over one thousand pounds in 2024, with Agnes set to receive this sum in the event of Alice's demise. In June 1904, Alice, at the age of 74, suddenly dies from extreme convulsions after having eaten a hearty meal that had been prepared for her by Sarah Ann, wife of her son Isaac Pearson. Alice dies painfully. All of the neighbours comment on the strange suddenness of her death, but no further action is taken, mostly due to her advanced age. With her burial and no questions asked from the authorities, everything quietens down. Sarah Ann leaves Isaac and emigrates to Canada. Agnes Black, Alice's daughter, moves to England. And on the 7th of December 1904, Pearson, Alice's son, is indicted for violating a girl. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, on the 7th of December 1904, Porter Down case. Isaac Pearson was indicted for committing an offence against a girl named Mary McAladian near Portadown on the 28th July last. The jury found the prisoner guilty of an attempted offence and assault. Sitting in his cell whilst awaiting his trial, Isaac considers his limited options. One news report wrote that Isaac approached the magistrates stating that he had had a dream that his mother had been killed by his wife and sister. Other news reports state that the dream sequence was nonsense and that he had directly approached the governor offering information about the murder of his mother some six months prior. Isaac's information is treated with scepticism by the authorities possibly motivated by an attempt to limit the harshness of his sentencing coupled with revenge at his wife for leaving him. However, in a due diligence kind of way, 
the body of Isaac's mother is exhumed for testing. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, the 15th of November 1904, analysts report not yet made an absurd rumour. It is not thought probable that an inquest will be held on the remains of Mrs Pearson, whose body was exhumed a few days ago in consequence of a statement made by her son at present in Armagh jail awaiting trial on charge of criminal assault to the effect that his mother died from the effects of poison administered as he alleged by his wife Alice Pearson who is now in America. The authorities have not yet received the report of Professor Berkeley to whom the viscera of the deceased woman was forwarded for analysis. The true version of the alleged murder cannot, therefore, be known until the police adduce the evidence which they have collected at the magisterial investigation, but before that can take place it will be necessary for the constabulary to get into their custody one or perhaps two persons who would appear to be implicated and who are not at present within the jurisdiction. There is absolutely no truth in the absurd statement circulated in an evening newspaper that the prisoner, Isaac Pearson, had given the secret away in a dream. The fact is that he intimated to prison officials that he desired to make a confession and asked to see a magistrate. District Inspector Cottingham from Portadown, who has charge of the case and who, with Head Constable Devin, has been vigorously prosecuting inquiries for time, was appraised of this and afterwards attended at the jail and took the man's statement. Pearson has a sister who is supposed to be living in England. However, to everyone's surprise, with analysis done on Alice's exhumed body, large quantities of both metallic mercury and strychnine are found. The metallic mercury would not have killed Alice, but it would have given her stomach and bowel issues. The strychnine, on the other hand, could easily have killed several people. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News on the 19th of November 1904, the Porter Down poisoning case, result of the analysis. Unless a special order is given by the Irish government, it is not intended to hold an inquest on the remains of Mrs Pearson, whose body was exhumed some days ago in consequence of an allegation that she had died from the effects of poison administered by her daughter-in-law. This serious charge was preferred by the deceased son, Isaac, against his wife, Sarah Ann Pearson, who is at present in Canada. As already reported, Isaac Pearson is confined in the county jail awaiting trial on the charge of criminal assault. That the late Mrs Pearson died from the effects of an irritant poison, there is now not the shadow of doubt. For Mr Robert Barclay of Belfast, who analysed the stomach, found it very considerably full of metallic mercury together with traces of strychnine. The truth or falsity of the prisoner's allegation that the poison was administered by his wife is, of course, a matter that has to be proven. It is expected that it will be some considerable time before the police will be in possession and position to place the evidence which they have collected before the magistrates. It will be first necessary for them to get into their custody one or two persons, but before that can be accomplished, certain rules and regulations will have to be complied with. In the meantime, it is expected that the authorities will here have made arrangements for having the suspected persons kept under investigation and observation.
With a murder investigation underway and two suspects in different international locations, efforts are made to find both Sarah Ann, the daughter-in-law, and Aggie, the daughter. Police investigators are sent to Canada and England to attempt to capture the two suspects and bring them back to Armagh for trial. Sarah Ann, with collected evidence weighing most heavily against her, is brought to trial first, with the daughter, Agnes Black, attending the whole of the proceedings. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, the 20th of February 1905, the Rich Hill poisoning case, magisterial investigation, serious charges against relatives, sensational evidence. The proceedings in connection with the Rich Hill poisoning mystery were opened at Armagh on Saturday, when two women, daughter-in-law and daughter, accused of the alleged murder of old Mrs Pearson at Mullalish on June the 27th last, were brought up at the courthouse and charged with the crime. The story of the murder was told to the prison officials while Isaac Pearson, son of the deceased, was in Armagh jail awaiting trial for assaulting upon a woman, for which at the winter assizes in Belfast he was sentenced to 15 months' imprisonment. Agnes Black, daughter of the deceased, was arrested at Walls End Police Office on the 15th of December. On the journey across to Ireland, she is alleged to have made important statements to the officer in whose custody she was, which led to further inquiries from which serious developments are expected. Mrs Black, who, during her imprisonment under remand in Armagh jail, has given birth to a child, denies any complicity in the crime and declares that she was hurried away from her mother's house on the day that she met her sudden death. Mrs. Alice Pearson, deceased, complained that day that her dinner was bitter and died shortly after the meal, but owing to her advanced age, death was attributed to natural causes. There was some talk amongst the neighbours afterwards, and suspicions of an unnatural death were freely spoken of, but until the confession of Pearson in prison, there was no direct evidence upon which the police could base any charge. When the body was exhumed and the viscera was analysed by Professor Barclay of Belfast, a considerable quantity of metallic mercury and strychnine were discovered, the purpose of which has since been investigated by the police with successful result. Isaac Pearson, who is still in jail undergoing the sentence imposed upon him by Judge Wright, will not be called as a witness in view of the fact that his wife and sister are incriminated. It appears that on the voyage from Canada to Derry, Mrs Pearson made statements to Sergeant Richardson, the officer who received her into custody under the extradition warrant. But the nature of this has not yet been disclosed. It is believed, however, to have an important bearing on the case. The two prisoners were separately conveyed for, from Armagh Jail to the courthouse in Abraham. Mrs Black arrived first, followed shortly afterwards by her sister-in-law, Mrs Pearson. A large crowd had assembled in the vicinity of the Hall of Justice to witness the arrival of the accused. The first incident of interest at the sitting of the court was the identification by a druggist of one of the accused who purchased poison from him. After a careful survey in the court, he pointed to Mrs. Pearson, who was attired in black and sat in the barrister's bench, accompanied by a number of other women, including Agnes Black, all wearing dark costumes. Mr. Belford, the clerk of the court, having read the charge, the evidence was ready 
by Mr. Monroe for the Crown. Mrs. Pearson was evidently labouring under a great agitation and followed the course of the case with the keenest interest. A pathetic figure was the other prisoner, Mrs. Black, who fondled her newly born babe in her arms. Several witnesses are brought forward attesting to Alice Pearson's general robust health at the time of her unexpected death, despite her advanced years, also of the known fractious relationship within the family and the easy spending ways of both children. Testimony is given regarding an increase in diarrhoea that Alice had commented upon to her friends. This would be the expected result from poisoning by metallic mercury, which probably would not kill you, but would certainly impact the body. There was a considerable amount of metallic mercury in Alice's body, giving the impression that attempts had been made to poison her slowly. More witnesses are produced who had been by Alice when she died and had seen the convulsive torment she underwent before her death shortly after the heavy meal she had received from Sarah Ann Pearson, her daughter-in-law. Further evidence is brought forward of Agnes having taken out an insurance policy on her mother prior to her mother's death. The small sum Aggie referred to is approximately eight pounds, which is worth a little over one thousand pounds in 2024. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, 22nd of February 1905, The Doctor's Evidence, Rich Hill Poisoning Case. The magisterial investigation into the Rich Hill poisoning mystery was further continued yesterday in the courthouse in Armagh, when Mrs Agnes Black and Mrs Sarah Ann Pearson, daughter and daughter-in-law respectively of the late Alice Pearson of Mullavely near Kirkhill, were charged with having willfully and feloniously caused Alice Pearson's death on the 27th of June last, administering poison to her. As on the two previous days of the inquiry, the prisoners were driven to the courthouse in charge of police escort. Mrs Black carried her infant charge in her arms and nursed it tenderly and with evident affection throughout the day. Both prisoners looked much more depressed than on Monday and were, as usual, accommodated with seats behind their respective solicitors. They never once recognised each other during the proceedings and studiously avoided even passing a glance in the same direction. Main interest centred on the evidence of Sergeant Richardson and Professor Barclay. Sergeant Richardson had brought the prisoner Sarah Ann Pearson from Montreal and it was an accepted belief that to him she had made an important statement after the arrest. Though it was a market day in Armagh, there was again a large attendance of the general public. Professor Barclay, public analyst from Belfast and the counties of Antrim, Tyrone, Donegal and Londonderry, an analyst to a number of public bodies, was the next witness. Examined by the Crown solicitor, he deposed that on November the 8th of last year he received from Sergeant McReynolds Richhill a box containing four jars and a bottle, all properly sealed. The first jar labelled name of deceased Alice Pearson, part of body enclosed, stomach, date of examination 7th of November 1904. The contents of the stomach, said the witness, consisted principally potatoes, porridge and milk. He found metallic mercury which weighed 462 grams equal to 2,694 grains, this being mixed with the food. The mercury separated out quite easily. It had never before been found, nor had he been able to trace any record of 
a similar case where the mercury was found or in such quantity in a human body. Witness produced a bottle containing the mercury. He also found in the stomach one-seventh of a grain of strychnine. The second jar contained the liver and kidneys of the deceased. In both of these organs he found strychnine to the extent of 132 grains. Of the metallic mercury found, the analyst said that mercury did not act as a poison while in its metallic state, although it was popularly considered to be poison. He thought it must have been administered almost immediately before the strychnine, and that this accounted for it remaining in the body. When asked about the properties of strychnine, the doctor responded that its impact was on the nervous system, producing convulsions and contractions. Having regard to the fact that the deceased complained of a bitter taste in her mouth before dinner and again after it, and was then seized with these muscular contractions, it would help to draw a conclusion as to when it was taken or administered. In his opinion, the death of Alice Pearson had been caused by strychnine poisoning. With the establishment of strychnine having been purchased by Sarah Ann, Sarah Ann having made the last meal before Alice died, the insurance policy on her mother's life from Agnes, the case was looking bleak, albeit purely circumstantial. Sarah Ann, extradited from Canada, found an unexpected confidant in the Armagh policeman escorting her back, unaware that he was meticulously documenting their conversations, she unwittingly provided a comprehensive and admissible confession. Police Sergeant's Story, Mrs Pearson's Remarkable Statements Sergeant Richardson, who was called for examination before half-past three, replying to Mr. Monroe, said the warrant for the arrest of Sarah Ann Pearson in Canada was handed to him. When he saw Sarah Ann Pearson on the 31st of January, she made a statement on that occasion, and she had not received any warning from himself. She said, Aggie and Isaac are a bad pair to get me into this trouble. I bought threepence worth of strychnine in oars in Amar. It was Isaac gave me the money and paid for my cab in. I gave it to her in her dinner of mashed potatoes and eggs. When she was eating, she said it was sour and, and she said she didn't like it. I said it was the same as I took myself. When I bought the poison, I gave the name of Sarah Hewitt. I gave the name of my own hometown, Rich Hill, and when I went to live with Alice, Agnes had her almost purged to death. She continued, They laughed in court in Canada when they heard about him, Isaac, dreaming. It was a nice dream. His eyes were open when he dreamed it. He knew as much about it as I did. At a later period, while on the steamer returning to London, she said, I had to laugh at Agnes the night the old woman died. She looked at her insurance book and said, God damn, I'll only get half of the insur insurance money. That is what was troubling her at the time. She said later, I don't expect to get off free and I don't deserve it. It was too wicked an act. It was all Isaac's fault, all for a few pounds. If it was a couple of thousands, it would be something, and I never got a half penny of it. They divided it all between them, and I threw the remainder of the strychnine into the fire. While the evidence was being heard, Mrs. Pearson's eyes darted rapidly and affrighted glances between the sergeant and the magistrates, as if to estimate its effect, and her complexion, pallid at the best of times, became almost ashen in its pallor as she listened to the narration of the dreadful admission she had made. 
The other prisoner, Agnes Black, sat and listened in open-mouthed astonishment to the evidence, clutching her little baby convulsively to her breast, her eyes starting wildly. So terrible was the impression made by the evidence that not a sound was heard in the court, save the sound of the witness's voice and the scratching of the clerk's pen. The verdict seemed almost foregone, although the defence strenuously argued that Sarah Ann's husband, Isaac, had coerced her into the poisoning plot. They also contended that Sarah Ann, due to her purported weak-mindedness and below-average intellect, was easily influenced. With the end of the evidence and trial, the judge summed up the evidence and charged the jury to do their duty. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, the 10th of March, 1905, Judge's Charge. His Lordship proceeded to sum up at length and recited to the jury the evidence given by the several witnesses in detail. An awful and revolting crime had been committed in their county. Could they have any doubt, whatever in their minds, from the symptoms seen in the last moments of the old woman's life, and from what was found in her body after that she died from strychnine poisoning? And had they any doubt that it was the hand of Sarah Ann Pearson that administered the poison? Did they doubt the evidence of John Orr, the druggist, as to the sale of the poison? If they had any doubt whatever on their minds, the prisoner was entitled to the fullest benefit of the doubt. Had the jury any doubt in their minds that this woman knew when she bought the poison what she was doing and what the effect that poison would be, it was an awful crime. He could hardly find a parallel in his knowledge of crime in this county. If they found there was no room for any reasonable doubt, then they ought to do their duty in accordance with their oaths, and the jury retired at six o'clock. Verdict and Sentence On their return there was a flutter of excitement in the crowded court, and the conversation which had previously prevailed was hushed. Having answered their names, the foreman of the jury in reply to the clerk of the court, announced that they had found a verdict of guilty with a recommendation of mercy. His lordship, who was visibly moved, then passed sentence of death, the execution to take place on the 30th of March. The prisoner, who did not appear to thoroughly realise her awful position up at this stage, was removed from the dock and as she disappeared from view down the steps of the dock, she was observed placing a handkerchief up to her eyes and was apparently weeping. Tomorrow morning, Agnes Black, the daughter of the deceased, will be put on trial, charged in connection with the poisoning of her mother. The following morning, Agnes Black, baby held tightly in her arms, is tried for the murder of her mother. Much of the evidence that comes out is a repeat from Sarah Ann's trial. The consensus seems to be that whilst Agnes had been trying to kill her mother slowly through repeated dosing with metallic mercury, Sarah Ann obtained the strychnine and fed it to Alice to finish her off. From the Irish News and Belfast Morning News, the 11th of March, 1905, Judges Charge. At the end of the trial, his lordship proceeded to invite the attention of the jury to the evidence in detail. It was, said the judge, a terrible and awful case they were trying. They were trying the case of a daughter charged with a crime, horrible, unnatural and revolting, the shortening or attempting to take away her mother's life by administering a noxious poison. Some remarkable testimony had been given in this case, and this, against other evidence, 
struck him as showing that Agnes Black, whether she committed that crime or not, was a woman of somewhat callous nature, and had not towards this old woman feelings that a daughter generally would, and towards a mother who had given her birth. Having dwelt at length upon the evidence, his lordship pointed out that the prisoner had voluntarily given her address in England to the police before leaving, so that it could not be suggested she was a fleeing of justice. During the last half hour of the wretched old woman's life, when she was expiring in agony, it did not appear that any one was with her but her own daughter. What occurred during that half hour? It was proved that from the hour the prisoners came to live with their mother, the latter suffered from the cutting of the bowels, diarrhoea. Purchases of mercury for the prisoner or by her were proved, and it was proved at the analysis that mercury was found in the old woman's stomach. The jury retired at 5.40 and returned with a verdict of guilty. Despite some sympathy for the woman, particularly Agnes, who looked a pathetic creature with her baby in her arms daily, the jury's decision led to a death sentence for Sarah Ann Pearson and life imprisonment for Agnes Black. Within the community, there was an immediate push to commute the death sentence. A comprehensive petition, eventually spanning 200 pages and signed by figures such as both archbishops, all jury members and witnesses, and a multitude of supporters, all pleaded for clemency. On the scheduled execution day, the inspectors of lunatics recommended mercy, advising the Lord Justices to commute her sentence to penal servitude for life. Consequently, she was granted a reprieve. As for Isaac, he was sentenced to 15 months hard labour, no doubt reduced due to his testimony regarding the murder of his mother. The murder of Alice Pearson in Armagh resounded in the community for decades. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, Mother-in-Law Murder in Armagh. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.